during my long and intimate acquaintance with Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I had never heard him refer to his relations, and hardly ever to his own early life. This reticence upon his part had increased the somewhat inhuman effect which he produced upon me, until sometimes I found myself regarding him as an isolated phenomenon, a brain without a heart, as deficient in human sympathy as he was preeminent in intelligence. His aversion to women and his disinclination to form new friendships were both typical of his unemotional character, but not more so than his complete suppression of every reference to his own people. I had come to believe that he was an orphan with no relatives living, but one day, to my very great surprise, he began to talk to me about his brother. It was after tea on a summer evening, and the conversation which had roamed in a desultory, spasmodic fashion from golf clubs to the causes of change in the obliquity of the ecliptic, came round at last to the question of atavism and hereditary aptitudes. The point under discussion was how far any singular gift in an individual was due to his ancestry and how far to his own early training. In your own case, said I, from all that you have told me, it seems obvious that your faculty of observation and your peculiar facility for deduction are due to your own systematic training. To some extent, he answered thoughtfully, my ancestors were country squires, who appear to have led much the same life as is natural to their class, but nonetheless my turn that way is in my veins and may have come with my grandmother, who was the sister of Vernet, the French artist. Art in the blood is liable to take the strangest forms. But how do you know that it is hereditary? Because my brother Mycroft possesses it in a larger degree than I do. This was news to me indeed. If there were another man with such singular powers in England, how was it that neither police nor public had heard of him? I put the question. With a hint that it was my companion's modesty which made him acknowledge his brother as his superior. Holmes laughed at my suggestion. My dear Watson, said he, I cannot agree with those who rank modesty among the virtues. To the logician... All things should be seen exactly as they are, and to underestimate oneself is as much a departure from truth as to exaggerate one's own powers. When I say, therefore, that Mycroft has better powers of observation than I, you may take it that I am speaking the exact and literal truth. Is he your junior? Seven years my senior, how comes it that he is unknown? Oh, he is very well known in his own circle. Where, then? Well, in the Diogenes Club, for example. I had never heard of the institution, and my face must have proclaimed as much, for Sherlock Holmes pulled out his watch. The Diogenes Club is the queerest club in London, and Mycroft one of the queerest men. He's always there from quarter to five to twenty to eight. It's six now, so if you care for a stroll this beautiful evening, I shall be very happy to introduce you to two curiosities. Five minutes later we were in the street, walking towards Regent Circus. You wonder, said my companion, why it is that Mycroft does not use his powers for detective work. He is incapable of it. But I thought you said, I said, that he was my superior in observation and deduction. If the art of the detective began and ended in reasoning from an armchair, 
my brother would be the greatest criminal agent that ever lived. But he has no ambition and no energy. He will not even go out of his way to verify his own solutions, and would rather be considered wrong than take the trouble to prove himself right. Again and again I have taken a problem to him, and have received an explanation which has afterwards proved to be the correct one. And yet he was absolutely incapable of working out the practical points which must be gone into before a case could be laid before a judge or jury. It is not his profession, then, by no means. What is to me a means of livelihood is to him the merest hobby of a dilettante. He has an extraordinary faculty for figures, and audits the books in some of the government departments. Mycroft lodges in Pall Mall, and he walks round the corner into Whitehall every morning and back every evening. From year's end to year's end he takes no other exercise, and is seen nowhere else, except only in the Diogenes Club, which is just opposite his rooms. I cannot recall the name, very likely not. There are many men in London, you know, who, some from shyness, some from misanthropy, have no wish for the company of their fellows. Yet they are not averse to comfortable chairs and the latest periodicals. It is for the convenience of these that the Diogenes Club was started, and it now contains the most unsociable and unclubbable men in town. No member is permitted to take the least notice of any other one. Save in the stranger's room, no talking is under any circumstances allowed, and three offences, if brought to the notice of the committee, render the talker liable to expulsion. My brother was one of the founders, and I have myself found it a very soothing atmosphere. We had reached Pall Mall as we talked, and we were walking down it from the St. James's end. Sherlock Holmes stopped at a door some little distance from the Carlton, and, cautioning me not to speak, he led the way into the hall. Through the glass panelling I caught a glimpse of a large and luxurious room, in which a considerable number of men were sitting about and reading papers, each in his own little nook. Holmes showed me into a small chamber which looked out into Pall Mall, and then, leaving me for a minute, he came back with a companion whom I knew could only be his brother. Mycroft Holmes was a much larger and stouter man than Sherlock. His body was absolutely corpulent, but his face, though massive, had preserved something of the sharpness of expression which was so remarkable in that of his brother. His eyes, which were of a peculiarly light, watery grey, seemed to always retain that faraway introspective look which I had only observed in Sherlock's when he was exerting his full powers. "'I am glad to meet you, sir,' said he, putting out a broad, fat hand like the flipper of a seal. "'I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became his chronicler,' His weight is against his being a sapper. He is in the artillery. Then, of course, his complete mourning shows that he has lost someone very dear. The fact that he is doing his own shopping looks as though it were his wife. He has been buying things for children, you perceive. There is a rattle which shows that one of them is very young. The wife probably died in childbed. The fact that he has a picture book under his arm shows that there is another child to be thought of. I began to understand what my friend meant when he said that his brother possessed even keener faculties than he did himself. He glanced across at me and smiled. Mycroft took snuff from a tortoise-shell box and brushed away the wandering grains from his coat front with a large red silk handkerchief. By the way, Sherlock, said he, I have had something quite after your own heart. A most singular problem, 
submitted to my judgment. I really had not the energy to follow it up, save in a very incomplete fashion. But it gave me a basis for some pleasing speculation. If you would care to hear the facts, my dear Mycroft, I should be delighted. The brother scribbled a note upon a leaf of his pocketbook, and ringing the bell, he handed it to the waiter. I have asked Mr. Melas to step across, said he, he lodges on the floor above me, and I have some slight acquaintance with him, which led him to come to me in his perplexity. Mr. Melas is a Greek by extraction, as I understand, and he is a remarkable linguist. I interpret all languages, or nearly all, but as I am a Greek by birth and with a Grecian name, it is with that particular tongue that I am principally associated. For many years I have been the chief Greek interpreter in London, and my name is very well known in the hotels. It happens not unfrequently that I am sent for at strange hours by foreigners who get into difficulties, or by travellers who arrive late and wish for my services. I was not surprised, therefore, on Monday night, when a Mr. Latimer, a very fashionably dressed young man, came up to my rooms and asked me to accompany him in a cab which was waiting at the door. A Greek friend had come to see him upon business, he said, and as he could speak nothing but his own tongue, the services of an interpreter were indispensable. He gave me to understand that his house was some little distance off in Kensington, and he seemed to be in a great hurry, bustling me rapidly into the cab when we had descended to the street. I say into the cab, but I soon became doubtful as to whether it was not a carriage in which I found myself. It was certainly more roomy than the ordinary four-wheeled disgrace to London, and the fittings, though frayed, were of rich quality. Mr. Latimer seated himself opposite to me, and we started off through Charing Cross and up the Shaftesbury Avenue. We had come out upon Oxford Street, and I had ventured some remark as to this being a roundabout way to Kensington, when my words were arrested by the extraordinary conduct of my companion. He began by drawing a most formidable-looking bludgeon loaded with lead from his pocket and switching it backward and forward several times as if to test its weight and strength. Then he placed it without a word upon the seat beside him. Having done this, he drew up the windows on each side, and I found to my astonishment that they were covered with paper, so as to prevent my seeing through them. I am sorry to cut off your view, Mr. Melas, said he. The fact is that I have no intention that you should see what the place is to which we are driving, it might possibly be inconvenient to me if you could find your way there again. As you can imagine, I was utterly taken aback by such an address. The paper over each window was impenetrable to light, and a blue curtain was drawn across the glasswork in front. It was a quarter past seven when we left Pall Mall, and my watch showed me that it was ten minutes to nine when we at last came to a standstill. My companion let down the window, and I caught a glimpse of a low arched doorway with a lamp burning above it. As I was hurried from the carriage, it swung open, and I found myself inside the house, with a vague impression of a lawn and trees on each side of me as I entered. Whether these were private grounds, however, or bona fide country, was more than I could possibly venture to say. There was a coloured gas lamp inside which was turned so low that I could see little save that the hall was of some size and hung with pictures. In the dim light I could make out that the person who had opened the door was a small, mean-looking, middle-aged man with rounded shoulders. As he turned towards us, the glint of the light showed me that he was wearing glasses. Is this Mr. Melas, Harold? 
said he. Yes. Well done, well done. No ill will, Mr. Melas, I hope. But we could not get on without you. If you deal fair with us, you'll not regret it, but if you try any tricks, God help you. He spoke in a nervous, jerky fashion, and with little giggling laughs in between. But somehow he impressed me with fear more than the other. What do you want with me? I asked. Only to ask a few questions of a Greek gentleman who is visiting us, and to let us have the answers, but say no more than you are told to say, or... Here came the nervous giggle again. You had better never have been born. As he spoke, he opened a door and showed the way into a room which appeared to be very richly furnished. But again the only light was afforded by a single lamp half turned down. The chamber was certainly large, and the way in which my feet sank into the carpet as I stepped across it told me of its richness. Our conversation ran something like this. You can do no good by this obstinacy. Who are you? I care not. I am a stranger in London. Your fate will be upon your head. How long have you been here? Let it be so, three weeks. The property can never be yours. What ails you? It shall not go to villains. They are starving me. You shall go free if you sign. What house is this? I will never sign. I do not know. You are not doing her any service. What is your name? Let me hear her say so. Kratides. You shall see her if you sign. Where are you from? Then I shall never see her. Athens. Another five minutes, Mr. Holmes, and I should have wormed out the whole story under their very noses. My very next question might have cleared the matter up. But at that instant the door opened and a woman stepped into the room. I could not see her clearly enough to know more than that she was tall and graceful, with black hair, and clad in some sort of loose white gown. Harold, said she, speaking English with a broken accent, I could not stay away longer. It is so lonely up there with only... Oh, my God, it is Paul! These last words were in Greek, and at the same instant the man with a convulsive effort tore the plaster from his lips and, screaming out, Sophie! Sophie! rushed into the woman's arms. Their embrace was but for an instant, however, for the younger man seized the woman and pushed her out of the room, while the elder easily overpowered his emaciated victim and dragged him away through the other door. For a moment I was left alone in the room, and I sprang to my feet with some vague idea that I might in some way get a clue to what this house was in which I found myself. Mr. Latimer followed closely at my heels and took his place opposite to me without a word. In silence we again drove for an interminable distance with the windows raised, until at last, just after midnight, the carriage pulled up. You will get down here, Mr. Melas, said my companion. I am sorry to leave you so far from your house, but there is no alternative. Any attempt upon your part to follow the carriage can only end in injury to yourself. He opened the door as he spoke, and I had hardly time to spring out when the coachman lashed the horse and the carriage rattled away. I looked around me in astonishment. I was on some sort of a heathy common mottled over with dark clumps of furze bushes. Far away stretched a line of houses with a light here and there in the upper windows. On the other side I saw the red signal lamps of a railway. The carriage which had brought me was already out of sight. I stood gazing round and wondering where on earth I might be, when I saw someone coming towards me in the darkness. As he came up to me, I made out that he was a railway porter. Can you tell me what place this is? I asked. Wandsworth Common, said he. Can I get a train into town? 
If you walk on a mile or so to Clapham Junction, said he, you'll just be in time for the last to Victoria. So that was the end of my adventure, Mr. Holmes. I do not know where I was, nor whom I spoke with, nor anything save what I have told you, but I know that there is foul play going on, and I want to help that unhappy man if I can. I told the whole story to Mr. Mycroft Holmes next morning, and subsequently to the police. We all sat in silence for some little time after listening to this extraordinary narrative. Then Sherlock looked across at his brother. Sherlock Holmes shook his head. This young man could not talk a word of Greek. The lady could talk English fairly well. Inference that she had been in England some little time, but he had not been in Greece. Well, then, we will presume that she had come on a visit to England and that this Harold had persuaded her to fly with him. That is more probable. Then the brother, for that, I fancy, must be the relationship, comes over from Greece to interfere. He imprudently puts himself into the power of the young man and his older associate. They seize him and use violence towards him in order to make him sign some papers, to make over the girl's fortune, of which he may be trustee, to them. This he refuses to do. In order to negotiate with him, they have to get an interpreter, and they pitch upon this Mr. Maylas, having used some other one before. The girl is not told of the arrival of her brother, and finds it out by the merest accident. Excellent, Watson, cried Holmes. I really fancy that you are not far from the truth. You see that we hold all the cards, and we have only to fear some sudden act of violence on their part. If they give us time, we must have them. But how can we find where this house lies? Well, if our conjecture is correct, and the girl's name is or was Sophie Cratides, we should have no difficulty in tracing her. That must be our main hope for the brother is, of course, a complete stranger. It is clear that some time has elapsed since this Harold established these relations with the girl, some weeks, at any rate, since the brother in Greece has had time to hear of it and come across. Send the boy for a four-wheeler, and we shall be off at once. He opened the table drawer as he spoke, and I noticed that he slipped his revolver into his pocket. Yes, said he, in answer to my glance. I should say from what we have heard that we are dealing with a particularly dangerous gang. It was almost dark before we found ourselves in Pall Mall at the rooms of Mr. Melas. A gentleman had just called for him, and he was gone. Can you tell me where? asked Mycroft Holmes. I don't know, sir answered the woman who had opened the door. I only know that he drove away with the gentleman in a carriage. Did the gentleman give a name? No, sir. He wasn't at all handsome, dark young man? Oh, no, sir. He was a little gentleman with glasses, thin in the face, but very pleasant in his ways, for he was laughing all the time that he was talking. Come along, cried Sherlock Holmes abruptly. This grows serious, he observed, as we drove to Scotland Yard. These men have got hold of Melas again. He is a man of no physical courage, as they are well aware from their experience the other night. This villain was able to terrorise him the instant that he got into his presence. No doubt they want his professional services, but, having used him, they may be inclined to punish him for what they will regard as his treachery. Our hope was that, by taking train, we might get to Beckenham as soon or sooner than the carriage. On reaching Scotland Yard, however, it was more than an hour before we could get Inspector Gregson and comply with the legal formalities which would enable us to enter the house. It was a quarter to ten before we reached London Bridge, and half past before the four of us alighted on the Beckenham platform. Holmes rushed to the door and out into the hall. The dismal noise came from upstairs. He dashed up, the inspector and I at his heels, while his brother Mycroft followed as quickly as his great bulk would permit.
three doors faced up upon the second floor, and it was from the central of these that the sinister sounds were issuing, sinking sometimes into a dull mumble and rising again into a shrill whine. It was locked, but the key had been left on the outside. Holmes flung open the door and rushed in, but he was out again in an instant, with his hand to his throat. It's charcoal, he cried. Give it time. It will clear. Peering in, we could see that the only light in the room came from a dull blue flame which flickered from a small brass tripod in the centre. It threw a livid, unnatural circle upon the floor. While in the shadows beyond, we saw the vague loom of two figures which crouched against the wall. From the open door there reeked a horrible, poisonous exhalation which set us gasping and coughing. Holmes rushed to the top of the stairs to draw in the fresh air, and then, dashing into the room, he threw up the window and hurled the brazen tripod out into the garden. We can enter in a minute, he gasped, darting out again. Where is a candle? I doubt if we could strike a match in that atmosphere. Hold the light at the door, and we shall get them out. Mycroft, now! With a rush, we got to the poisoned men and dragged them out into the well-lit hall. Both of them were blue-lipped and insensible, with swollen, congested faces and protruding eyes. Indeed, so distorted were their features that, save for his black beard and stout figure, we might have failed to recognise in one of them the Greek interpreter who had parted from us only a few hours before at the Diogenes Club. His hands and feet were securely strapped together, and he bore over one eye the marks of a violent blow. While there, she had met a young man named Harold Latimer, who had acquired an ascendancy over her, and had eventually persuaded her to fly with him. Her friends, shocked at the event, had contented themselves with informing her brother at Athens and had then washed their hands of the matter. The brother, on his arrival in England, had imprudently placed himself in the power of Latimer and of his associate, whose name was Wilson Kemp, a man of the foulest antecedents. They had kept him in the house without the girl's knowledge, and the plaster over the face had been for the purpose of making recognition difficult in case she should ever catch a glimpse of him. Her feminine perception, however, had instantly seen through the disguise when, on the occasion of the interpreter's visit, she had seen him for the first time. The poor girl, however, was herself a prisoner, for there was no one about the house except the man who acted as coachman and his wife, both of whom were tools of the conspirators. Months afterwards, a curious newspaper cutting reached us from Budapest. It told how two Englishmen, who had been travelling with a woman, had met with a tragic end. They had each been stabbed, it seems, and the Hungarian police were of opinion that they had quarrelled and had inflicted mortal injuries upon each other. Holmes, however, is, I fancy, of a different way of thinking, and holds to this day that, if one could find the Grecian girl, one might learn how the wrongs of herself and her brother came to be avenged.